Now, I, I have no idea how far Derek talked about carburetors. Okay? The, the only thing that I do know is he gave you some. He was going to show us a video, but he couldn't because he couldn't log in. He couldn't log in? Yeah, about how carburetors are cast. Are casted? Yeah. Just like every other can cast. What, Sam? Sam? Watch? Yeah. Okay, you talked about the Venturi effect, right? Now, G.D. Venturi, Italian scientist, because in the 17 and 1800s, the Italians did everything. Pascal's Law, what? Galvani with the frog battery, uh, Luigi Galvani, Alessandro. He's the one that basically made the first battery. Um, and he was a, he was a, a well, no, he made a battery. He was dissecting a frog, uh -huh. and it had two uh, dissimilar uh -huh. metals. Yeah. And he's poking around, and all of a sudden, the frog go. <laughs> and so he got into electrochemical stuff, you know. And and his buddy that lived like in the next city state over, I think he was in like he was in Rome, and the other guy was in Florence or Milan or whatever. Was Alessandro Volta? That's what the term Volta comes from. And he was the one that actually made the first battery out of like brine cells, you know, he used brine and connected them together. Oh, yeah. But he didn't know how to deal with it. The first person who really invented the battery and, and put it to practical use was the inventor of everything. Who was the inventor of everything? Durandville. Who? Durandville. Who? Benjamin no, it wasn't that. Benjamin Franklin. Benjamin Franklin. Invented, invented everything. I mean, the, the guy was a, was yeah. brilliant. You and know. The next question is: Is he helped set up the patent office? How many patents did he? I have no idea. Zero, but he set it up. He, yeah, he set it up, but he, he's the same. Do it. Well, he was the first hospital, first post office, fire department. Fire department. I mean, the guy was lightning rods. Yeah, the guy. The guy was just skills, glasses. So finally, we got an American inventor that actually did something, but before then it was all the Italians and the French. And then, after that, it was the Germans, they built everything. So, the Venturi effect. Okay, let's see if somebody remembers the lecture. What, what is the Venturi effect? What is the Venturi effect? Give me a brief overview. Are you good at me? Yeah. Okay, Jordan, it's all yours. I even got a picture of up on the on the projection screen. Did you hear that picture? Yeah, almost. No. He must have been very quiet. I well, I actually know there would be a towel there harassing me. Uh, towels here too? Yeah. Oh yeah, that's oh. right. Towels here. I mean, that 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 that's that's uh. That's saying something. Yeah, that's bad stuff. Right <laughs> okay, turn my phone on. Okay, Jordan, lay it on us, baby. Teach us. Uh, there's a venturi in the carburetor that is. Uh, at a slower diameter on one side than the other. Yeah. And as air passes through that, it accelerates, creating a low pressure area. And the fuel is a bowl in a high pressure area. So, because it wants to heat up, the fuel goes in the high pressure area and the low pressure area. Correct. That's the venture effect. Okay? That's how carburetors essentially work. Now, carburetors are incredibly smart for a stupid piece of sand cast aluminum. They, they have no. They only have like one moving part, maybe one or two. There are very few moving parts. But carburetors are incredibly smart because they sense manifold pressure. Okay? Now, most EFI systems, up till when the maps came out, uh, manifold air pressure sensors, which is only in the last 10 years or so, EFI systems were stupid as a post. You know? And you can't call it fuel injection. You know, I run along on this all the time. Fuel injection, fuel injectors don't inject squat. Fuel injectors just go, oven closed, oven closed. Oh, that's all fuel injectors do. They should call it, this is a fuel valve system. Fuel injectors don't inject squat unless you get to a DI, a direct injecting motor, then there's pressure behind it. But standard fuel injection, like we all know, multi-port, cross diddle, uh, flux capacitor injection, all of it. <laughs> it is all just stupid injection. The injectors open, close, open, close. That's all they do. They're just, they're just little electro, electro magnets. They're just electronics. They're little solenoids. Yeah, they're little electro solenoids, and the fuel pressure behind them, which is created by the pump and the pressure regulator, 
is what's, what creates a spray through a miniature nozzle. So all that crap, well, we'll get into the yeah, fbi but, so we got the basics of Venturi effect. What else is incredibly the same as a Venturi effect? The wing of an airplane. The wing of an airplane that works exactly the same way as the Venturi effect. You know, we get, yeah, air speeds up over the top. We get low pressure, go slower here. We get high pressure until this tips up high enough and it starts to turbulate and then we got all kinds of that. We have stall. Well, it can lift just like that. Yeah, it'll lift like that. What they do though, as this inclination goes up like this, mm -hmm. what happens is this split angle, the air split angle, becomes so harsh that the air no longer follows the plane. It goes off like this and it creates a turbulence there. Yeah. And that's what stall is. Okay. Anyway, that's 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 yeah, that's top down. Right. Let's right. talk some airplanes. So Venturi effect. Now With that in mind, and how all carburetors work, you got the basics. But carburetors are fussy little animals. In small engine, 90% of your repairs, if something ain't running, you claim the carburetor. You go through the darn carburetor because that's the problem. Uh, it was sort of that way with cars too, it was all, when, when they were carburetor. It's always a carburetor. We, the one advantage to EFI because it is a closed system. But EFI, essentially, the only thing that's vented in, in that fuel system is the gas tank. And our gas tanks are vented in a carburetor system, too. But with the system being closed, high pressure closed, great. Great to see you. Uh, with, the, with the system being closed, we actually have less contaminants. There, there's less opportunity for the Schmidt Sola to get in there, you know, uh, and so, yeah, so we get we get a better we get we get less hassle. Carburetors for cleaning, you let that fuel sit in there. Fuel mixes with the with the air and the, you know, just regular air, and that's where it all goes down when fuel starts mixing with air. Right now, how long if you go pump some fuel into a cup, measuring cup, so you can look at it. <laughs> How long before that fuel starts to go bad? The stuff you go down and get some serious mad gas. The mad gas. How long before that starts to deteriorate? Just throw me a guess. Two weeks. Six months. That day. It's about 45 days. About 45 days. You're a little under. You're a little over. Now it's way up. Yeah, you were. About 45 days. Why? And this didn't used to be the case. This did not used to be the case. Why is that? Because, because it's not so much the detergent. What? Well, the lead is gone. That is the reason. Why? Why? Why the ethanol? Ethanol actually burns hotter. But burns cleaner. Ethanol also also absorbs water. That's that's one reason. Now I wasn't going to go there, but because alcohol is a blend. Okay, I'm, I'm not talking about a blend tank. I'm talking about a combining blend. You can take alcohol, and alcohol sort of semi-mixes with water and semi-mixes with gasoline. And the base of ethanol is alcohol, okay? But there's one other property that alcohol also, ethanol, ether, uh, what's, the, what's the main component, uh, chemical and carbon there? Um, I can't think of it right now. What happened? Acetone. Acetone. What happens? What happens to those components? What? Why does that affect our fuel? Why does that make our fuel go bad? Bingo. Evaporates. It leaves. It leaves schmutz. It evaporates. That is our problem. And when you start blending alcohol or ethanol or whatever into your fuel, it evaporates twice as fast. Evaporation is our death in carburetors. Is, that's the reason why we have to, oh, it's out for six months. Well, go clean it and clean again. Oh, this thing, we have to clean the carburetor. Evaporation is the problem. Mixture with air, and it evaporates. 
That's why the EFI system has been a little less troublesome because of, of the absence of outside air. But we have to have, like it says, like your like Geronimo over here said, we have to have <laughs> we have to have atmospheric pressure or the carburetor will not work. Why? Why does this have to be vented to atmosphere? <coughs> Think about it. Why does that have to be vented? Why don't we just cap it off and then we don't have the problem anymore? Exactly. It's got to it, if it just have you ever seen a gas tank on something where the vents clog, like a plastic gas tank? The vent gets clogged, especially on an EFI system, it just starts to go like this. It just gets a huge amount of negative pressure in there, and it actually starts to implode and suck itself in. But what's very dangerous about that, especially in a two-stroke, is we have negative pressure in our flow bowl. So when we have low pressure in our flow bowl, by Jordan's explanation, what happens? We have low pressure, and low pressure, what happens? We run the lean because our pressure equalizes. Okay? And when our pressure equalizes, we don't got out of the pool. We, we, we don't have, we don't have the, the fuel flow we'll go lean. Yeah, and then you get sandblasting on the piston, and you get rings snagging in the exhaust port. All have it, cats and dogs living together. It's terrible. So it, 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 it's all kinds of habit. And, and that's why. But it's really interesting. I'll talk about this. I'm going to try to keep it down. I'm going to talk about this. Ski do. Everybody came out with fuel injection. Our cat, we're, I'm, I'm, I, I sort of run back to mama whenever I get any principles. I run back to my snowmobiles. But Ski do was the last one to really fuel inject. And they didn't even, they had a little standard fuel injection for a couple of years, and they went straight to DI. Okay? Um, it's making me nervous. I still want to look at it. Oh, okay. Careful, careful, back up thing. Okay, Skidoo actually controlled barometric pressure, temperature. They put, all, they put sensors, they put EFI sensors into an ECU with carburetors. And you might think, throttle position, Air temperature, barometric pressure, all that, and they still used carburetors. And the way that they did it is they, <laughs> is they took my picture away. Uh -huh. They control pressure into the flow bowl. Toronto. They put, they, they created a negative pressure in the flow bowl, and then they controlled the negative pressure. You know, I'll show you how they did it. It's pretty cool. Uh, they, they just sort of, everybody else was playing the EFI game, fuel pumps in the tank, batteries, or batteryless, or needed more power and all that. Skeeter was still throwing carburetors on and making it work with compensation for altitude and temperature and intake air temperature and barometric pressure, which is out. You know, it, it, very interesting the way they did it. But that being said, carburetors, okay? Jordan. Sort of need the book there you go. to teach this class. <laughs> Look on page. Uh, yeah, George. Yeah. I do. Okay. Let's do this. So, give me. Did, did you get anything confusing last week? But do you even remember what happened? Do you even remember your names from last week? No. What's, what's that? Just talk about jets. Just jets. Okay. This is what. what I'm going to teach you a little bit about carburetors and tuning carburetors and what they do. Now, I, I'm using a standard BM carburetor here. I'm just going to use a, a standard BM carburetor, what they call a BM. But it's very, very, very common. Grow up. It's very common in all the stuff. Oh, there you go. Here, we'll put the bearing on there and hold it down. That works. Okay. This is a standard BM carburetor. Now, look at this graph really close and notice this right here. This says these are our components pilot jet, pilot air screw, throttle valve, needle jet, jet needle. I, I think they should have thought of a different name. 
they should have at least, instead of just calling it a needle jet and a jet needle, they should have called it like the pincer, or the poker, or the, the jabber, or whatever, besides, jet, yeah. Now, look at this. I want you to look at these. It's a little, it's a little blurry. These are throttle positions of the carburetor. All the way closed, full throttle open. Look at all the crossover in these components. So see where, see where the black is? That's where that component affects it. Okay? So our pilot jet is only closed to a little over quarter. The pilot air screw, about the same. The needle jet, the jet needle, the main jet right here, whole level, we don't even care about that. So look, our, our main jet doesn't even come on until half throttle. And so if somebody's cruising down the road, you know, partial throttle, and they're lean and it's not running and it's popping, you know you're lean, you don't go changing your main jet. It, it, I gotta change my jet because I'm lean. There's absolutely no function except for after half throttle. There is a ton of components in there that make a huge difference and they all cross over. So that makes that makes it a little bit uh, it makes it a little wow, yo, yeah. it makes it a little bit confusing. So I I, I just want to briefly show you what the parts look like so you can sort of relate them to there. Okay? Obviously We have the, the body of the carburetor, and that's where they talk about the float level, you know, and all that. The float level really isn't that big of a deal in these carburetors. Uh, the thing that's more important than float level is actually the seating of the new one's seat. That is created by the float, but that's it. So, let's look at the first component there, the pilot jet. We've, we've already had experience with the pilot jets, you know, trying to get the little wire to go through it. That sucker, go ahead and take that and pass that around. Most of them are that small, some of them are a little bit bigger, but most of them are about that size, and it goes down in this little channel, right there. So the pilot jet is always the one that clogs first. It's always the one that you have trouble with. It's always, that's the first one to get spooged out. You can open the carburetor and, your main, and it might look all clean and everything, but that will be blocked, because it's the smallest orifice. It's gonna, it's gonna, the evaporation is gonna affect that the most. Okay, that's the one you'll play with the most. Okay, now remember when you're working on the carburetors, which darn hole it comes out of, and remember that there's actually a jet down in a hole. Just spraying something to your main jet isn't gonna do slow. Okay, the next thing on there is what. The pilot air screw, which on this one I didn't pull out. It's an adjuster right here, okay? Now, remember, here's our slide. This is the part of the carburetor that goes up and down, okay? If you have any adjuster screws on the air intake side of the slide, they control an air passage, okay? They control an air passage. If you have any adjusters, forward of the slide, forward of the thing that goes up and down, or the thing that flaps. That is a fuel adjustment screw, okay? Now, let me, so, so obviously you have a screw here, right back here. This air adjustment screw, like I said, the pilot air screw, is behind the slide on the air intake side. So when I screw it in, I am controlling air. But when I screw it in, that means I am cutting the air off. I open it up, I give it more air. I close it down, I give it less air. Okay? What's that? What it is, it's just a little. You can have a little screwdriver. Oh, okay. I can hear you. It, 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 it needles just like a. There's an air passage right here. A flowing air passage right there. Okay? And it's just a metering needle. And so. You know, just like with a fuel meter. So when you cut that in, when you start screwing that in, it starts blocking off that air passage. That air passage mixes with your pilot circuit. Okay? So say I have a lean bob on the bottom. I know I'm lean. 
This is where people get confused. I'm lean. I need more fuel on the bottom. So what do I do with this? You screw it in. It's, you, have, you have to take your mind and go whoop, flip around backwards and let the gray matter ooze out. Because you're letting it get less air in, less fuel in. Well, no. The same amount of fuel will be delivered depending on your jet. Okay? What I'm doing is I'm blending it with less air, thus I'm enriching the low end. Okay? You let it out and you're airing the low end. You're a little fat on the bottom. You want to lean it out. So remember that. Back of the slide is an air adjustment screw. Forward of the slide, in other words, motor side, air intake side. If you have a little adjuster down here, down here, down here, stick it up out of there, or wherever, they, they stick them everywhere. When you screw that in, you're shutting fuel off. You're doing the exact opposite. When you open it up, you're giving more fuel. And those are usually only low end adjustments. After quarter throttle, all this crap means nothing because we've gone into our pipe, into our needle jet and our jet needle, okay? Jet needle, needle jet. There's like a hundred different sizes of these. This, when you open and close the throttle, slips into there. This has a specific, that's a specific, 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 this has a specific taper, this has a specific taper. There's a hundred of these, and there's about 50, 60 of these. So you can imagine the combinations you can get for tuning. Now look at our chart. Okay? We'll jump over. Let's out. Okay. Let me, let me jump back. i got to keep with the coons. Uh, throttle valve. This is what lifts. When you, whoop, when you hit the gas, this is lifting up. What they're talking about throttle valve is look at this. When you first open the throttle, this angle of cut has a difference on how much air loads into the carburetor. The steeper this angle cut here is, the more air it lets in. The shallower, or like say if this was just flat, that, that's a really, really, really rich uh, cutaway because it's not letting any air in, you're just getting all fuel. As this steepens up right there, that initial burst of air on the pilot low end up to about, what, half throttle? Uh, no, a little bit more. No, about half throttle. It's half throttle. Up to about half throttle. If you go steeper on this, you're leaner. You're letting more air in because this angle's steeper and the volume under that angle is great. So you whoop, got more air in the low end. So you have your tunability in there, okay? Then you move on to the needle jet. Right here, this taper. This is a 159, which this is, is the style of carburetor, and this is a Q0. Then you've got a Q2, Q4, Q6, Q8. And then before that, you have a P0, P2, P4, P8, and it goes through like a whole bunch of letters. I mean, you've got an infinite amount of uh, adjustability. Okay, these don't get very dumped up there. It's a, it's a, it's a very, it's a pretty big orifice. Okay, then you have the needle. This meters, so you start pulling this up, and the more fuel can get through there. Okay, because the tapers get larger. You know, this is pulling out of there, and these tapers get larger. Right. Yeah, and it starts pulling out. That's how it controls the mid-range fuel. Stacked on the end of this thing, eventually, when that needle pulls far enough out. You got maximum taper, you got maximum flow. That's when, so, that's not that. That's when the main jet comes on, okay? The main jet comes on after half the throttle. They say before, but really, you don't even tune for half the throttle, okay? The needle, as the jet needle, actually you have a, a three-way overlap. The very end of the jet needle, the very end of the needle jet and the very beginning of the main jet will all have adjustability. If you look at that needle, you notice on that needle how it has slots in the top. You can find adjustment with that clip by dropping it down or raising it in the car. Okay? Okay. I could go on and on and on and on about carburetors. Uh, I've worked on more carburetors than 
I could possibly ever. But if you have these basic concepts down, that you know that the pilot jet is sunk down in some hole somewhere, you got to get that out and clean that out. Usually I have, I used to have a little piece of wire in my toolbox, like one strand of an electrical wire, and that's how you clean them out. You're just, you have to bring them through. Okay? Um, and then you know the needle, the needle jet, they all have them. But that's how it works. So don't think that, a, that jetting means changing the main jet. Okay, even though at altitude, we do have to change the main jet. Okay, what happens, what happens at altitude? Why, why are we jetting for altitude? What? what? Air skinner. Air pressure. Plus air. Okay, we, got, we, we sort of got two things. But the variant is this. The variant is density. Okay? If you take a one liter square box, how much volume of air does that have? Okay. If it has one liter at sea level, how much does it have at 10,000 feet? One liter. One liter. You've got one liter no matter what. But the variable is the density of the air, okay? This is what happens with air density. As you go up, the air density goes down. But in reverse, what happens, how, how can you get more air density? No, we're not talking about compressed aspiration yet. What, what, do you, what can you get, what, what's another variable on air density? Air density, a turbocharger makes for some massive air density. Temperature. What happens? The hotter air gets, the more expands the less density you have. Colder air is thicker. It's more dense. It's all about density, okay? Volume does not change ever. It's the density of the air. As we go up, it's less. As we go hot, it's less. Correct the movement. So you play this little ballerina game with, with jetting at elevation. Almost always you go down for elevation. You look on jetting charts, it'll say elevation and temperature. Elevation and temperature. But that is only a main jet specification. We just are trying not to burn the thing down. How much does it change? I mean, how much does it change to? Because I don't know as much as Well, do this. Well, you've lived at elevation for a while. Live at not elevation for a while, and then come up here and run a quarter mile. Your lungs will tell you right away. I actually hike up to the high limits, take a rest, and then start running. Yeah, you, you go up to elevation, and you take a little run. <laughs> that's, that's pure air density, right? There's just not as much air to breathe, OK? It's just not there. So. Standard air density at zero elevation at 70 degrees is like 14.2. That's how it, that's how it's it's done. It's in something square feet cubed, like liters per something square something, something. What are you talking about? That's air density. That's how they measure air yeah, density. Yeah, they measure basically the square foot of yeah. the ground all the way up. At, to the, at like our the elevation area. here, we're probably about 12 seven. Okay. Starts to go get thinner. The density starts to get less. But remember, the cold makes it denser. So you're playing that game. That's the beauty of of, of, an, of a monitoring fuel system like EFI, because you have sensors that sense barometric pressure, which is elevation, temperatures. They send basically either ohm signals or volt signals to the ECU and say I'm at this and this, and then it's all mapped out by computer. Now, uh, there's two types of fuel delivery systems with carburetors. Motorcycles are, mo uh, are they're gravity feed. There's no pump, okay? We have gravity feed and we have pressurized. With carburetors, we have gravity feed and pressurized. Gravity feed is pretty common in motorcycle. You know, the gas tanks above the carburetors, fuel switch, it just, you know, atmospheric pressure flows down. 
Then we have the pressurized style. The pressurized style use a fuel pump, okay? The fuel pump is operated by engine pulse. In order for a fuel pump to work, you either need an arm going like this to move a diaphragm in and out, or you need something to make it go like this, or to rotate. Now, small engines don't use rotation. They use vacuum pressure. Remember, back to our two-stroke. Our, our piston goes up. Remember, we got a huge suction. A piston goes down in the crankcase, we have pressure, okay? So all they do is drill and tap a hole in the crankcase. They hook that, it's called a pulse line. They hook that to the pump, and when that engine's going like this, the pulse line's going and you have the little diaphragm in the pump and the little valves, and that's how they work. Simple pulse pumps. Very incredibly reliable Makuni pumps in most small engines. Now, we'll get to carburetors, like on your weed whacker or your lawnmower, it, it's internally pumped. And these right here. These are Makuni BN carburetors, okay? Those are off an 800, the Yamaha 800cc twin watercraft pump. They are internally pressurized. So the little <laughs> is right here. The pump is built in to the carburetor, okay? And it's that pressure. Then you, you have a needle and seat. You have a needle and seat that just doesn't work off the float level. There's a spring on it, okay? So that pump has to pump up to a certain amount of pressure before it will release into the, into the fuel chamber. Okay, and that's called pop-up pressure because when it finally opens, it sort of pops and flows the fuel in. This makes it so that these carburetors can do this. They'll run at any angle because they're internally pressurized. They'll run at any angle, whereas you flip that sucker over and fuel just pours out the vents. Okay, there are no multiple vents in these. These are fully pressurized carburetors. They actually work pretty good. They don't use them on anything else but, but, uh, but uh, commercial wire. Um, but that, we can get into how we can start tearing these down and we can go on and on and on and on. And on. But these carburetors, they look different, but they have the same stuff. They have a pilot jet, they have a mid-range circuit, they have a main jet. It's, it's basic carburetors. They all have basically that same style of control. Okay, these actually have way less parts. These are very simple carburetors. A little, a little harder to tune because of the mid-range issue. You actually tune the mid-range with that pop-off pressure that I told you about when the needle opens. You tune the mid-range with it at what pressure that opens. So you have a whole variable of springs under the little arm that holds the needle and seat. So you can Bend the tab that that pushes on for micro adjustment, or there's five different springs, different spring weights 65, 80, 90, 110, 125 um, springs. And so that's, but I don't want to get too hard into that, okay? But the basic concepts here are the Venturi effect isn't just, oh, cool, it's a Venturi effect. Now you understand that because of the Venturi effect, if you plug the vent on that, why you go lean? Because the pressure the gradient changes. It, it, the pressure equalizes. Okay. Remember, we have pressurized and gravity feed. That's pretty basic stuff in carburetors. Um, the only other thing I wanted to talk to you about is the pressurized flow pulse. Okay. So what's what Skidoo did? Here's our flow ball. There's our, oh, that's going down. That's our venturi, our air is coming in. Our air, that's plugging into the motor, and then the exhaust, spraying out. Okay, and then the slide comes up like this. So essentially, I just drew a picture of that. What, what, that's yeah, not a very good picture. But, so we have vents out of these float balls. These float balls just vent to atmosphere. Because as this level drops, if we don't replace that with air, we'll get negative pressure.
okay? Just like I said, the gas tank will go and the motor will burn up. So we then these to atmosphere. What Skeeter did is they took both of these and they put them into this little tube like this. And on the end of that tube, there's a needle, okay? This needle right here had an electronic plug and went off to the ECU. So they took the sensors, they took a throttle position sensor, a barometric pressure sensor, an air temperature sensor, and what they did, they basically created negative pressure in you know? They stopped up the vents, okay? So all the air that this needed to get atmosphere needed to come through that needle, okay? So instead of venting to atmosphere, they vented through this needle right here, okay? So if the needle was open, it allowed atmospheric pressure in, and we had higher pressure down here and lower pressure up here, okay? But you shut this needle, all of a sudden we start to get lower pressure here. It delivers less fuel because our pressure starts to equalize. And then what they did with this thing, they used all those sensors out of the ECU and they made this needle vibrate. Okay, like this. And it would vibrate slower if they needed more air in the, to, to control the, the pressure in there and faster for less air. So basically, they used all their sensors and controlled the pressure in the float bowl with a vibrating needle, just opening and closing. And the needle would vibrate more when they needed more fuel and less amplitude when they needed less fuel. Because it would create a negative, if it was less, that means it was closed more. And it, it would create a higher negative pressure in the float bowl, thus restricting the jet. That's how they did it, with a little vibrating needle. Actually. Pretty ingenious, some guy, you know, drinking eating a pretzel and drinking a beer in a bar, out of that, you know. It, it's, and that's how they controlled it. And they did that all the way up to 2010, when everybody else was full committed to fuel injection. Articat started fuel injection in 93. And they stayed with carburetors until 10. And they were only forced away from it because of EPA. Yeah, they, they were forced away from it because it was easy. But if, if, if you think about it, it's an ingenious little thing. You see how they, you under, after understanding the Venturi effect and the high and low pressure, they just started controlling the pressure, okay? And thus, they would regulate the amount of uh, fuel going through the main jet. That's how they regulate it. So when they went up in elevation, the sensor would say we're higher in elevation, the needle would vibrate more. And it would cut off. It's pretty, it's pretty, and they calibrated light to the nuts. It was, it was pretty cool. But, like say an, an 800 Skidoo without uh, DPM, that's what they call it, DPM. Without DPM would run a main jet about 280 or 290. If you had DPM, the main jet was a 420. So you had to be very careful when you were jetting because you could still jet this system. I mean, obviously, a hole in the flow bowl is a hole in the flow bowl. And if it's bigger, it's going to flow more. Okay? You still have to jet this. But in order to make this system work properly, they had to put big Mondo jets in. Just, just really, really big, big jets. Okay. Have I lost everybody? The only reason I know all this crap is because I screwed it all up in my life. Seriously, I have messed up everything you could possibly imagine. You learn by breaking right. So let me see if I uh, got through air density, uh, negative pressure compensation, that's that. Oh, let's talk about one more thing. A cold start enrichment circuits. We've got three cold start enrichment circuits. You know, we need more fuel in order to start all cars, everything needs more fuel when they're, when they're dead cold. Small engines. And carburetors use three enrichment style circuits. They use a choke plunger, which is the most common. Okay? It's just a little plunger. You know, you've seen the choke, the flip chokes. You know? When you flip that choke, it's just a little cam 
and pull the plunger up the car rear. With a big old Mondo hole down to the pole and it just dumps a ton of fuel in the intake. Okay? That's a choke plunger. But that will not work unless your throttle plate is closed. If you open your choke, because people think, oh, I gotta take a full throttle or get it some pump, you know, to get it going. We gotta pump that throttle, because that's gonna help it go. No, it doesn't help it go at all. When you open your throttle, your manifold pressure goes down. Okay? And so the choke plunger needs a ton of manifold pressure to suck all that fuel out. So if you open your throttle and open your choke, you basically, it's one over one. You just cancel that. You have to keep your throttle closed and open your choke. You fire it, wait for the machine to fire, then you flip your choke off. Okay? That's the first circuit. The next circuit is they just put a flap in the intake. Okay? And they increase the pressure in there. And they draw out more fuel. Okay, they put a flap in the intake. This is the most common to every lawnmower, every weed whacker, every you pull that little knob or anything. All it's doing is putting a plate in front of the carburetor. Okay, you can even do it with your hand. If you put your hand over the intake of the carburetor and try to fire it up, fuel will just, you know, just soak the, in there. So we have a plunger, the pressure flap, and then we have a primer. Okay, a primer is external. Okay. So you have a little primer pump, just a little thing you go, little, shit, a shit, little shit, thing. Shit. It's, a, it's a little pump. Yeah. Yeah. Like on the whackers and the lawnmowers, it's that little pump. In a snowmobile or a watercraft, it's it's actually a handle you go shit, shit, and it actually just squirts fuel down the carburetor throat and enriches the circuit. Those are the three ways that small engines enrich for full start. Okay. My favorite on watercraft is is a uh, is a primer. It, it, I mean, watercraft. You know, some watercraft will sit there. And it takes forever to start those things. You have a you have a, a primer, quick, quick, fire drive. But snowmobiles are much more fussy to the amount of fuel they get. So if you sit there with the primer, well, it's really cold out here. So yeah, you just flood the living jeebers out of your snowmobile. It takes four days to start. You know. It'll explode. <laughs> so the primer would be a lot like if you have a carbureted car or something and it's cold out and they tell you to pump the gas. Correct. Because the reason why is because they have accelerator pumps. Now, some of the some of the newer uh, personal watercraft started installing accelerator pumps in the carburetor. And it was an EPA thing. Okay? Because they at idle Two strokes tend to generate a little more spooge out of the exhaust. You know, you know, have you ever seen like something idling around and a two stroke and it's like puffing and it's falling in it? They tend to be a little more richer on the bottom end. And the reason they need that is that they need that pulse of a big pulse of fuel to get them to rev quick. Okay? But at idle, they're sort of dumb in that crap. So what, what they did instead is they made their pilot jet really small and they threw an accelerator jet in there. So it added the fuel when it needed it when you, when you stab the throttle. Okay? They never work as well. They don't work as good as like doing a car. Two strokes need a little faster. Mm. So. Now, I'm going to tell you one screwy thing and then we're done. When you're jetting at elevation, when you're jetting a carburetor at elevation, to make something run better, you need to put less main jet in it, which is what we've been talking about, because of air density. But you need to put more pilot jet. Everybody goes, no, you're going up to no air, you can't do that, you're going to lean out all your jet. No, you do not lean out all of your jets at elevation. You go up in size in pilot, down in size in main. And the reason is because our volumetric efficiency the amount of air that the carburetor can flow is less, okay? If you have a small pilot jet, if you went smaller, remember I told you that the two strokes need, and the four strokes too, need a pulse of fuel to get going. When your, vol when your volume is less, you don't have that same oomph. You don't have that same pressure. And so you go, with a stock jet, you don't have enough fuel. 
you start leaning it down and, and, and it just gets worse. You have to give it a little more fuel on the bottom when you go up in elevation. Everybody fights me on this. Uh, they just go, no, that's not possible. You can't do that. I said, no, no, no. Do whatever, do what you want. And then put big jets in. And then they finally put big jets in. Oh, hey, you know, you weren't right, but uh, we ended up putting big jets in. So uh, remember, down in Maine, up in pilot for elevation. ATVs, motorcycles, engines, <coughs> tractors. If we start playing the 8,000 foot, 10,000 foot game, you've got to have not quite, it's probably 50, 60% of the airplane. 35s, like my carburetor at 35, if I'm running at 10,000 feet, I'm going to 60. And well, even my Weber carburetors and my Porsches, I'll go from a 40 to a 65 at elevation. And so uh, that's the principle to remember if you're ever going to do a carburetor. And that's all I'm going to say. Uh, we could go on and on and on about carburetors, but I'm not going to go on and on about carburetors. That's enough. Unless you want more carburetor pain. With these basic components, with knowing that those components are in there, you've got all the skills to do it. Now remember, a lot of your ATP carburetors have an adjuster screw straight down like this. CVT carburetors. They have an adjuster screw under here, okay? It is forward of the slide. So it is a, it adjusts what? It's forward of the slide. Fuel. Back of the slide, airbox side, is air. That's a fuel adjustment screw, okay? That's an enrichment screw, mostly low end. Remember, whenever you're monkeying with that thing and you're cleaning your carburetors, be careful, because you'll screw that thing out with a nice little sharp needle there is a spring, and you'll probably see that. Oh, hey, there's a spring. Now we can clean it. Start blowing up with air. You start blowing stuff around, you know, in a car cleaner. All of a sudden, the little tiny washer and the little tiny O ring that was down in there that actually makes the circuit work has shot across the shop. And the diameter on it is less than the diameter of the screwdriver. It's tiny. Okay? So whenever you're messing with these, those carburetors that have that adjustment screw straight down, Remember that there's a washer and there's an O-ring in there. And usually what I use, you know my dental kits. You know me and my dental kits. I use a straight dental kit and I just I just hook the very end of it just a little. You just go down there and you can hook them right up. And then to put them back in, you load them on, you load your spring on, you load your washer on, you load your O-ring on your needle adjuster. And you screw back in. If that washer and that O-ring isn't there, you'll have an idle that goes like this. If you have an idle that you cannot chase, that you cannot get smooth, it's all over the place, and sometimes it revs higher and revs lower, and you almost guarantee you that that washer and that O-ring are not in the in the Okay. So finito. Six 
666, no, 266 rotations per second. Wow. That's the goal by a whole. Wow. So that's that's kind of vicious stuff. Per second. Per second. That's nuts. Oh, what you can think about it. Mm -hmm. The two strokes that run at 80, 85, <laughs> yeah. uh, our, our rotation speeds are just like mind boggling. And it holds it. Okay, we're done. Let's go work on anything we got to work on. Okay, my needle and needle tip. Oh, that's my dog. Brett? Brett? I didn't even remember it. Or Pepsi. You can't claim jet lag flying in California. It's just that you were carving. <laughs> you just have to yeah, so there you go. That's what you like. <laughs> now, do I wish I was there? Oh, yeah. Okay. That's, that's one rotation every Anyway, I'm going to say that. Those things, you know, this training that I went to when I missed, this training that I missed, went to when I missed, or Brad knows about it. But uh, we spun a, we built a, we blueprinted and built a Honda yeah. uh, K-series motor out of a Civic, Civic SI, which is a VTEC motor. Oh yeah, yeah, same thing. That K24 to K20, you know, the 2.4 liters or two, 2.4. So yeah, so we we took that motor, put a two liter head on it. Put a turbocharger on it, we built the whole motor, blueprinted it, and we pulled 567 horsepower at 18 pounds. 567. That was on the, it was on the back. Our first pull at 7 pounds of boost was 411. That's 411 was about as low as it would go. It Silly, stupid. Yeah. Yeah. Makes you want to put a hundred Yeah. I'm looking for a hundred for the lowest. Do a case swap on it. 400 horsepower at seven pounds of boost on pump gas. Something else uh, spectacular. 